Hi, Brian from Sue Generis Brewing here, and welcome to part three of my series on managing a beer Solera. In the first video, I discussed how you set up a Solera. In video two, we took a look at how a Solera is managed. And in this video, we'll look at how you finish the beer that comes out of that Solera. One important note, although I am presenting the refilling process and finishing process in separate videos, in reality, these processes occur in parallel, so you need to be prepared to perform both processes every time at the same time, whenever your Solera reaches maturation. In video two, we started with a detailed tasting of the beer so we could prepare a refill that would push the Solera towards our desired flavor profile. But as it turns out, that testing serves an important second purpose because those tasting notes will help us to decide how to finish the beer that we pulled out of the Solera. For clean beers, finishing is rarely required as these beers tend to emerge from the Solera ready to enjoy. But you might need to consider additional aging or perhaps aging on something like oak or spices or other flavorants to add additional flavor or character. Now I would always recommend adding these to the portion of beer you withdraw from the Solera and not to the Solera itself because you can more carefully add those ingredients to finish the beer. And if you happen to mess up and say over oak or over flavor that withdrawn portion, your Solera has not been affected. This is also a really good opportunity to refresh the hop character by dry hopping your beer. Now when it comes to sour beers, typically a lot more work is needed to finish them than do clean beers. And that's because even with the intensive management of the Solera, sour bills still usually emerge fairly one-dimensional in character. For example, they might have a nice bright acidity, but otherwise be kind of lackluster, or they might just be dominated by Britannomyces funk and really not have a nice or pleasing balance. So because of that, we typically need to do something to help balance out that beer and make a better final product. So if you're familiar with conventional sour beer brewing, then nothing that I'm about to tell you about in terms of finishing is gonna come as a surprise. In fact, the exact same approaches we use to balance out conventional sour beers are the same ones that we use to balance out a Solera. So in this video, I'm gonna to talk to you about my main approaches, the ones that I prefer. But these are just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many other ways that you can finish these beers that I'm not covering. If you want a really good guide, I'd recommend Michael Tosmeyer's American Sour Beers. This gives a really comprehensive overview of many of the different approaches you can use to finish a sour beer, including any beer coming out of a Solera. So the first thing you can do to finish a beer is just to not finish it. Sometimes beer will come out of the Solera that is pretty much perfect, and all you need to do is package it and enjoy. So if you like the way that beer tasted during that tasting, there really is no reason to do anything else to it. In fact, the portion of beer that I'm using for this demo today actually is one of those types of pulls. It's almost a perfect sour beer coming out of the Solera. So because of that, I actually packaged half of it straight up without modification so that I could enjoy it in that form. And then I modified the second half, uh, as you'll see later in the video, just to give an example of how beers can be finished. Now that said, most of the time, some work is needed to get that beer to a finished state. The next option is blending, and this is the most common thing you'll see in commercial sour beer production. With blending, you take two or more sour beers that have complementary characteristics, and you blend them together to make a more complex and well-rounded beer. This can often end up in a beer that far exceeds the individual contributions of the individual beers that get blended in. Now blending is a skill in and of itself, but when it's successful, you can generate some really magical beers. Now this obviously requires that you have other sour beers available. In my case, I often find myself using my Solera as the blending stock for my conventional sour beers. But you don't have to blend with sour beer. One of my favorite things to do with my Golden Sour Solera, my Everybody in the Pool Solera, is I blend it with Saison's. This makes really wonderful, complex, sour saisons, gives them a huge depth of character that you can't really achieve by brewing a sour saison straight up. But it comes with a little bit of a caveat, and that is that anytime you blend a sour and non-sour beer, you're pretty much guaranteed to have some small degree of re-fermentation, 
And because of that, you either have to blend those beers cold and consume them quickly, or you need to let that re-fermentation complete before you package your blend. If you don't, you're gonna get re-fermentation in your bottle or your keg, and that can lead to bottle bombs and other less than desirable outcomes. The third option is to put the beer into an aging vessel like a carboy and age it further. Now you can do this for a number of different reasons. I've done this when I've had a beer that came out of the Solera and it still needed some time to address off flavors. I've also used it when I wanted highly aged Solera beer for blending. One of the favorite beers I've actually made from my Flanders Red Solera was a 75 to 25 blend of recently pulled beer. So that was beer around 16 months in average age that was then blended with about four year old beer that I just happened to have left over from a previous Solera pull from that same Solera. Again, that combination of really aged beer with its really um, bright acidity and strong Britannomyces character mixed in with that younger, more fresh tasting, uh, younger pull from the Solera really worked out well. Fourth option is to add things like spices or oak or other non-fermentable flavorants. This is less common in traditional sour beer brewing, but it's something we are seeing more and more of among more modern sour beer producers, and it is a wonderful way you can add additional complexity to your beer. I found this to be a really powerful approach for beers where the Britannomyces character is lacking, and that's because some spices have similar flavors, and a great example of this is black cardamom. So it has a smoky and medicinal character that is actually not that different from sort of the smoky medicinal character that some Britannomyces produce. Likewise, cloves and pepper can add in some of those spicy notes that are fairly similar to those made by both Britannomyces as well as phenolic off-flavor positive Saccharomyces. But of course, you don't just merely need to mimic Britannomyces character. Spices can be used to add whole new flavors to the beer. Actually, one of my favorite examples of this was a Christmas beer that I made back in 2015 from my Everybody in the Pool Solera, my Golden Sour Solera. In this beer, I added cinnamon, nutmeg, cranberries, and a little bit of hibiscus to uh, some beer from that Solera. And again, it just made a nice uh, Christmassy beer. It had those Christmas spices in it. It had a bit of fruitiness from the cranberries and the hibiscus, and it just was really good. So my best advice for adding spices is to add them in very small amounts and to add them in a hot bag or some other container you can easily remove from the beer. And the reason for that is spices tend to take a while to sort of appear in the beer, but then they can very quickly overpower it. And so you need to be tasting frequently and by having the spices in a container, it's now easy to remove them once you hit your desired sort of level of flavor. Sort of by extension, I would really recommend against adding spices to the Solera itself because it's very easy to overdo it and ruin your Solera. And it's surprisingly hard to dilute spice flavors out of beer once they're in there. Now on the notes of spices, this is a great time to add hops. Dry hopping can add wonderful new flavors to your sour beer or even just refresh the initial hop character that you had put into it. And you can add hops during finishing at levels that would normally prevent souring if you did it before fermentation or during fermentation. And dry hopping is a great way to bring those characters into your beer and also does it without adding bitterness that might clash with the beer's acidity. So my next pull coming out of my Solera, which is in about a month, I'm actually planning on dry hopping, and I'm gonna do this with those Canadian red vine hops that I grew last summer as part of my 50 meter beer project. These hops have this great sort of dark cherry flavor with a little hint of citrus, and I think that's gonna work really well with this upcoming Solera pull. I might add a little bit of hibiscus just to bring in a bit of a fruit note as well, but I really do plan on those hops being the star. So the final way you can finish beer is adding fruit. And this is also sort of the biggest topic in this video. So fruit is a very traditional way to finish a sour beer. It's an excellent way to finish a sour beer coming out of a Solera, but it does add in some potential complexities that you're going to need to address. Many fruits work well with sour beers. They add new and interesting flavors. And especially if you have an under acidic or over acidic beer, these fruits can often help to balance that out. So for example, fruits like cherries and raspberries are very traditionally added, and they do tend to increase the apparent acidity of a at least under acidic beer. 
Whereas fruits like peaches and melons also work really well in a sour beer, but they tend to kind of pull back on that perception of sourness and are a way you can help balance out a somewhat over-soured beer. Fruit character can generally be added in five different ways. You have fruit extracts, dried fruit, canned or pureed fruit, frozen fruit, and fresh fruit. Dried fruits are often treated with preservatives, and in that case, you really shouldn't be using them in a lit beer. But if you can find them without preservatives, they do add a nice note to your beer. And the flavor of dried fruit is different than the flavor from, say, a fresh fruit or puree. So it's not just a nice uh, fruit flavor that you're adding, but it is somewhat of a unique fruit character. Now, in my case, I've not found a lot of fruits without preservatives, but I have had good lucks with raisins and dried figs, particularly in darker sour beers. In fact, back when my Flanders Red Solero was still running, that was one of my favorite additions uh, to add to them. I would actually uh, brown figs and dates in a fry pan, deglaze with a bit of red wine, and then put that whole mixture into the Flanders Red, and it just added a beautiful layer of complexity and flavor to those beers. Now, I've not had much luck with extracts, and I tend to avoid them, but I know other people have had success, so it's probably just the quality of extracts that I've had access to. I've only used puree once, and it did make for a nice tasting beer, but it was very gloopy and awkward to work with. Now, fresh fruit is great if you can get it, but it's probably the most expensive way to add fruit to your beer, and it does require you to do a lot of processing. I've also found it challenging to get enough fruit that's at peak ripeness at the same time when my beer is ready. Uh, so because of that, my preference is actually frozen fruit. When I fruit my Solera, or any other sour beer for that matter, probably nine times out of 10, it's using frozen fruit. So frozen fruit offers a number of advantages. It tends to be pre-processed, so all the pits and rinds have been removed. It's been cut into smaller pieces, so it's easy to add to your beer. The freezing breaks open the cells, so the extraction of the sugars and the flavor from the fruit tends to go a little bit quicker. But for me, the biggest advantage is that these fruits tend to be picked and frozen at peak ripeness, meaning you get the best flavor and aroma out of frozen fruit. I've actually never made a fresh fruit beer that was as good as some of the frozen fruit beers that I've made. But whether your fruit is fresh, frozen, canned, pureed, or dried, Using fruits adds some nice complexity and flavors to the beer, but it also adds complexity to managing the beer. And that complexity comes from the addition of fermentable sugars, which kick off a fresh round of fermentation. And that new fermentation can be problematic, mainly because sometimes it's gonna produce off flavors or even just conventional fermentation flavors that throw off the balance of your beer. I've actually had several occasions where I've had great sour beers that I've added fruit to, and the resulting fermentation off flavors led to a beer that was not as good as what I had started with, and which required extensive aging and even additional modification to bring back to something that I enjoyed. So fruit is great, but it can cause problems. Now there are a number of ways that issue can be addressed. Additional aging can help solve some of those off flavor issues, and of course you can blend or spice or otherwise finish the beer to try and push it back in the direction you want it to go. Those approaches are commonly used in commercial brewing and by a lot of home brewers, and they do work. But over the past five years, I've adopted a new method to dealing with fruit that seems to solve these issues up front. And in addition, it gives you new ways to bring new flavors and new character into the beer. I love to claim credit for inventing this, but it wasn't my invention. There's a lot of other brewers and breweries that use this approach, but in my opinion, it is the single best way to add fruit to a Solera or to any other sour beer. And it's actually a very simple approach, but it does add a few extra steps to the process of adding fruit to your beer. I start by placing fruit into the finishing vessel, and as I place the fruit into the fermenter, I sprinkle in layers of pectinase enzyme, which will break down the fruit cell walls. Now it's important you use pectinase enzyme and not pectin. Pectinase breaks down pectin and that's what the cell walls of fruits are made out of and so that helps to release the flavors of and the juices from the fruit. Pectin, on the other hand, could potentially turn it into jello. So you don't want to be using that. Pectin's what you use to thicken jam. Once the fruit has broken down a little bit, 
I then pitch in a yeast to ferment the sugars that have been released, and I ensure that that fermentation is complete before I transfer the beer from the Solera onto that fruit. So this approach offers three advantages. By adding that pectinase before fermentation, it accelerates the breakdown of the fruit, so you get quicker extraction of flavors and sugars. It also accelerates the clearing of the beer, so the finishing period for the beer becomes shorter. Secondly, because all of those fruit sugars are fermented before you add beer from the Solera, there's little additional re-fermentation. And so that avoids a lot of those issues that can arise in terms of re-fermentation producing off flavors or otherwise altering the flavor profile that you've already achieved in the beer. But in my opinion, the final advantage is the biggest advantage. And that is that you can select a yeast that will enhance the fruit's flavor and that can do a lot to really kind of turn up the fruit flavor to 11. So a lot of wine yeasts are known for creating and enhancing the flavors of specific fruits. And so you can choose one of those yeasts to really help bring out and emphasize the character of the fruits that you're adding. So I'm going to take you through this example using my most recent poll from my Everybody in the Pool Solera. Just as a reminder, this was a well-balanced beer, a little over acidic, and maybe a little less Brettanomyces character than I would prefer, but it was a wonderful beer up front. So it didn't need a lot of work, but it is a good beer to add some additional flavor to. So because it was a good beer, I did split it into two finishing vessels. The first 11 liters I just put into a keg and carbonated, and you know I just enjoyed it straight off the keg. Uh, kegging ensures I can enjoy it really quickly, uh, but I did bottle a few bottles to see how things age in the next few years. The second half I placed onto peaches, and that's because I really find peaches work well with highly acidic beers. They help to lower the perception of the acidity. So in this case I took 1800 grams of frozen peaches that I thawed and put them into a small carboy. As I mentioned before, as I add the fruit, I put in layers of pectinase enzyme, and that'll help to break down uh, the fruit. I gave that pectinase about eight hours to work, at which point I pitched D47. This is a wine yeast that is commonly used in a number of fruit wines, and it's really known for drawing out the flavor of fruits like peaches, so a perfectly good yeast to add to a peach uh, addition. I then let this ferment for about a week, uh, and I made sure I had complete attenuation, so all fermentation had stopped. And it was only at that point that I transferred beer from the Solera into the carboy. And I then gave the beer another two months to age. And it was at that point that I uh, packaged it into a keg, force carbonated it. Again, I put a couple of bottles aside for a year or two from now. And I actually wish I could do a, a live tasting with you here. But between my wife and I, we emptied that keg in two weeks. It was that good of a beer. I mean, it was uh, peachy sour um, you know it was ready over last summer so it was a perfect summertime beer uh, it just did not last it was really good now there is one last note i would make about this approach to using fruit and you know that pre-fermenting with a yeast can do a lot to enhance the flavor of the fruit and to prevent fermentation associated off flavors due to re-fermentation but it comes with a big caveat and that caveat is that wine yeast in particular may ruin your ability to repitch the dregs from that beer into another beer. So if you're the sort of person who likes to share their dregs with others, this is something you might want to keep in mind. And the reason for this is that many wine yeasts are going to be used to enhance fruit flavors. And many wine yeasts are killer yeasts, and that means that they produce toxins that kill other Saccharomyces yeast. And so that means that the conventional beer yeast that were used to ferment the wort in the Solera, as well as any wild yeast that might have made its way into your Solera, will not survive the presence of those wine yeasts. They will kill them all off. So because of that, if you then try to reuse that culture, the only Saccharomyces that will be in there is going to be those wine yeasts. It's not going to be the original brewing strains. So because of that, especially if you are the sort of person who shares cultures or shares bottles with people who might then try to use those cultures, it's really important to track any batches you add wine yeast to. 
So in my case, I like to label my bottles with simple little labels, and I just make sure in the lower right hand corner there's a K if there's a killer strain. That way I can tell at a glance at whether that bottle has a killer strain in it or not. And I don't have to remember batch to batch what's in there, I just have that symbol on the bottle. So if I find a bottle that's four years old, I can tell instantly whether it's a killer strain positive bottle or not. So that's how to finish beer out of a Solera. And it also brings us to the end of my planned video series on Soleras. Now that said, uh, please feel free to ask questions or suggest other Solera topics in the comments below. And if there's enough there, I'll put together a Q&A style video to wrap up this series. Thank you again for watching this video and this series on Soleras. If you've not brewed with a Solera before, I hope this video series gave you the motivation to give it a try. And if you are a Solera brewer, I hope there was something useful in here to help you out with your Solera. Again, I'm Brian from Sui Generis Brewing, and I hope to see you in a future video.